is being learned. Today's class is Le'ilui Nishmas Hashlucha Harabanis Sima Rivka Bas Nisanel Halevi. She was our classmate, and um, this loss has hit us all very, very deeply and profoundly. And if my memory is correct, the last words that she said to us last week was, the Rebbe said, Mashiach is here. We have only to open our eyes. Um, she said that in reaction to, I don't know, somebody, maybe me, I don't remember, said that we need Mashiach. And she said, she was very, very emphatic when she said those words. Um, well, we know that she always, she, sorry. I thought somebody wanted to say something. She always participated after the Shia and the Fabringen, and she brought ideas, like Zizi said, in a very inspiring way uh, to a practical level, always with um, great positivity and verb and spirit. Rebison Jaffe merited to be the Rebbe Shlucha to Manchester in England for 60 years. She was down to earth. She was warm. She was funny. She knew how to make everyone feel good because she was completely devoid of judgment, completely. It could be easy at first blush to misunderstand the profundity of her depth, of her iskashras. This was a woman who for decades hosted Mesiba Shabbos for young children in her home. Many people attributed this to being the catalyst for their journey towards Firmkeit. She was always busy. She ran a very open home. She hosted meals and events constantly with a special love for Neshe Chabad. And she constantly surprised people when they heard she was a Rebetzin because she was so very comfortable to talk with and she was so much fun. And, um, you, you know, certainly I did not know what I'm going to share now. Um, in my mind, I was like, wow, this is amazing. She is so dedicated. And, you know, she's a woman who has her own time now. She's certainly not dealing with, with little children anymore. So, you know, it's, it's like an opportunity for her to throw herself into the Rebbe's Torah. But her niece, Chaya Posner, was kind enough to um, share with me some of her recollections. And she related an astounding fact which she went back to verify with her father, Rabbi Shmuel Lu, Tzalangiyar. And uh, Chaya Posner shared the following, that um, uh, on one occasion, Rabbi Lu, maybe also with Mrs. Lu, who was a, who is a sister to Rabbi Avram Jaffe, Rabbi St. Jaffe's husband, Tzalangiyar. Uh, so one time they were in Manchester and he hazard from a Fabringen that he had heard on, on a hookup the night before. And um, she was so riveted that she asked him if she would be able to call him um, in subsequent times when there was Fabringen, and she recorded those calls, then she transcribed them, and then she taught them. And this went on for quite a few years, Chaya said. Um, this was before there were so many resources and um, it was easy to get uh, the Rebbe's Fabringen. This is what she did. She asked her brother-in-law to share with her what he had heard the night before. She transcribed, she, she recorded it, she transcribed it, and then she taught it. Um, she obviously had a very deep and long love affair with the Rebbe's Torah. Um, and I want to conclude with some personal recollections. Um, there was a time where um, Rebbe's in Futafas, uh, who lived in London for many, many years, um, had me uh, come to, to the UK once a year, once in 18 months. And um, there was one specific occasion, I remember very, very clearly, where Manchester was part of this. Um, and the only problem is that I had lost my luggage. In other words, not me, the airline had lost my luggage. And in those days, I was either traveling with a little baby or with one in the oven. And um, this time I was with a baby and I was distraught <laughs> because I didn't have anything. 
And I arrived to her house and I was in quite a tizzy and she calmed me with such kindness and so much love. She put me in the car. She arranged for a babysitter. She put me in the car. She took me shopping for everything. Let me just say from soup to nuts, you can fill in the blanks. Um, and, you know, being with her, I, I had only maybe seen her, I think, you know, I had no relationship with her prior to this, but, and sometimes it could be uncomfortable to be with somebody you don't know, shopping for personal things and even clothing. Um, and she just made the whole thing seem so natural and comfortable and seamless and as if she had nothing else to do in the whole wide world, except for, you know, calm me down. And, um, and I was a little embarrassed by the whole thing that I was like, so like, out of sorts about it. And I thought to myself, like, rationally, I don't have anything that gorgeous, that beautiful, that valuable. It was just my own shmatas that I was missing. Um, and maybe she realized that because when it finally did come and and I put on one of my own clothes that I had planned on wearing, she said, oh, that's such a great outfit. I wish I had something like that. And, and thinking about it, I think she she was just trying to validate me for being so, you know, also, everything was different, like in England, like I needed diapers, I needed like all kinds of things. And uh, she was so patient and um, just treated me so well and and made me so comfortable in her home and made sure that the baby was taken care of. And she just had that very, very warm, embracing personality that just made everybody feel loved. And uh, isn't that what all of this is all about in the final analysis? It's it's to take the Rebbe's love and his dedication and and to just uh, put it into practical everyday acts of service and love and and she certainly did that so we dedicate um, this class Le'ilu Nishmas Sima Rivka Bas Nisan Al Halevi and I know I can't be the only one who's expecting her to open her camera any minute in one of these boxes uh, but we can certainly feel her spirit and her love. Um, I, I was. It, it's interesting because I think that the Sikha today um, speaks very much to her spirit. I also thought it was interesting um, that the Sikha is juxtaposed on what we did last week. Last week, I don't know about anybody else, but I certainly um, was challenged and was struggling with the material. And uh, this week, I'm struggling with myself and how to take these ideas and um, and and really make them real in my life. And the other thing that struck me about the Sikha is how privileged we are. The Rebbe never told us what to think, but the Rebbe certainly taught us how to think. And this Sikha is like exhibit A uh, for that. So here we go. Yud Beis Yud Gimel Tamas. Sif Aleph. My father-in-law, the Rebbe told, related, in a relation to his imprisonment and his redemption from prison on Yud Beis Yud Gimel Tamas, that in the Maimorim that he taught on the Rosh Hashanah before his imprisonment, it speaks of the Baal Shem Tov's teachings regarding Hashgacha Pratis, his distinctive understanding of Hashgacha Pratis. Hashgacha Pratis, he gam, Al Haminim Doimim Tzameach Vechai. The Baal Shem Tov taught that Ashkacha Pratis extends to every strata of creation, including the inanimate, the vegetative, and the living, meaning not only people. Baal Kol Pratu Prat, and that it 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 relates to every single detail. Av She'in Yizel Loi Hayakashrim Gov HaMaimer. And Frida Kepper related that he spoke of these ideas, even though these ideas were not really related to the main theme of the Maimer, the Haisif. And he added the following. 
<clears throat> that if not for this, if not for his knowing and his teaching and his contemplating the Baal Shem Tov's idea of Hashgacha Pratis, Ein hu yodeya im haya yocha laseis lisbal as hayisurim vilatseis min hamaiser. If not for these teachings, he does not know if he would have been able to tolerate the tremendous pains and the travails of his imprisonment and to actually leave imprisonment, meaning if he would have been able to live through it. V'tzarech lahavin. And the Rebbe says, we have to understand. So this is what the Feit Rebbe said. And now the Rebbe says, we have to understand. Ha'chidush d'shita sabal shem t'rebina shkacha pratesu kenal. Shagam shar habruim shebesugim chayt samech v'daimim mushgochim bahashgacha pratesu l'idea kadosh baruchu. The novelty of the Baal Shem Tov, as said above, is that not only people, but that every aspect of creation, including the inanimate, is under Hashem's specific providence and watchful eye and orchestration. Aval hakol moid gamlu lechidusha Baal Shem Tov bi'in hashgacha pratis ala adam sukham adabe. But the Rebbe says, everybody agrees. You don't need the Baal Shem Tov to teach that there's Ashkacha Pratis on a person, on the on the on the strata of creation, on the category called Midaber, the one who speaks, meaning people. You don't you, you, that's not a Khidish of the Baal Shem Tov. Everybody taught that. Ubifrat Lagabe Yisrael Am And specifically when you're talking about Jews who are Shem's special and and the nation that is closest to God. And even more so, and even more so for those who are observant of Torah and mitzvahs, that they recognize the Hashgacha Pratis, they see the Hashgacha Pratis, there's no Hastara, there's no obfuscation, and therefore they can act on it. And how much more so when you're talking about a Nasi Yisrael, you're talking about a Rebbe. Everything that happens to them is not personal. It all has to do with Klal Yisrael. So it's it's plain and obvious that anything that happens to a Nasi is Hashgacha Pratis. And therefore, Madua Hutra Chayk Merichat Mi Admar so why, the Rebbe says, did my father-in-law, our Rebbe, need to reference the Chiddush of the Baal Shem Tev in order to be able to tolerate the pain of his imprisonment? Seemingly, anything that happened to him was, of course, Ashgach HaPratis. And for this, you don't need the Baal Shem Tev's Torah. And the wonder is even greater, says the Rebbe. And Bechlal, why are we talking about Hashgacha Pratis? It's one thing if we would be talking about somebody missing a flight or having to sit in an airport because the flight keeps getting delayed hours after hours after hours and you have to ponder what's Hashgacha Pratis. But the Rebbe says, but I, I don't even understand why we have to talk about Hashgacha Pratis in conjunction with the imprisonment of the Fetik Rebbe. For sure, this had to do completely with the observance of Torah and mitzvahs and the spreading of Torah and the strengthening of Judaism and the fulfillment of Hashem's shlichus. And it's clear and it's obvious, it's poshut, that this, that this is what was happening here at the Fitik Rebbe, that this is all Hashem's design. It's all Hashem's ratzin. It's all Hashem's desire. It's all his intention. It's all, of course, with divine providence. So why would we even have to, in other words, you know, we we go to Hashgacha Pratis when we can't understand something very often. But the Rebbe is saying, but here, it's so plain and obvious 
Why would the Fittich Rebbe have to say this? In other words, it, it doesn't even fit, seemingly. Beis. Bepashtos yeshleimer. Simply, we might say, Rebbe says, simply say, we might say, that's exactly the Fidget Rebbe's intention. Because in the Maimer that he that he gave over on Rosh Hashanah, he spoke about Ashkach HaPratis, because he had spoken of Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah is the day that encapsulates the whole year. Really, anything that's going to happen, that's going to unfurl throughout the year is already found in the essence of Rosh Hashanah. Because he had spoken about Rosh Hashanah, and Rosh Hashanah therefore, he was able to feel in a visceral way, in a magnified way, perhaps, that everything that was happening to him was Hashkachal Pratis, and therefore he was able to tolerate it. But the Rebbe says, but this is not, um, it's not computing. It's not satisfactory. But Rebbe says, but even so, it's not, it's not computing, because what should have been underscored was not Ashgach Pratis, which is superfluous to even speak of, but rather the idea that nothing bad comes down from heaven, meaning that whatever the Abishra does is positive and is good. And as explained in greater detail in Tanya, that this is the this is the this is the formula, perhaps, able to take Yusurim. Painful, troublesome torturous events. Ad adam lekablam And when one ponders that nothing negative comes from Hashem, one is able to tolerate the Yisurim until they're able to accept them willingly and with joy. May no one ever be tried in this way. Ukahiraz chazal and like Chazal teach, just like one makes a bracha when something good happens, one has to make a bracha when something negative happens. And what does it mean to be mevarech, to accept it besimcha? So in, in Sif Beis, the Rebbe is saying, it seems that what really should be under study here, or what we would think the Fitzgerald Kappa would have underscored, is the ability to tolerate Yisurim, travail, difficulties, and to do so besimcha. But why is he fixed on the Hashkacha protest thereof, which is something that we wouldn't think would even have to be mentioned? Gimel. And to make note, move on who he says, and it's understood why the Fetig Rebbe does not reference this idea of Ein Ra Yared Mil as a uh, as a formula or as a way for him to be, be able to tolerate the Yusurim of his imprisonment. And, exp and the Rebbe explains. The, it's for the following reason. The Rebbe, my father-in-law, my father-in-law was completely devoted and given over to the Abishter, to Tere, and to Mitzvahs. So much so 
that his personal existence did not take up any space, did not have prominence. V'lachein move on, and therefore it's understood, she yisur of hagashmim, lo yachlu lahabiyoy lidei matzav shal yuchal lizbal esam. So it's understood that for my father-in-law, the physical yisurim would never be able to bring him to his knees. They would never be able to bring him to a situation where he can no longer tolerate them. How could he even think that something is bad when he he is not thinking about himself? Good, bad, and different. He's not thinking about himself. So if he's not thinking about himself, his mind can't go to the place of, oh, this seems like it's bad, but I have to remember that nothing bad comes to the Ella. So once we take that out of the equation, we understand why he didn't talk about Ein Ra Yarid Milmaila, because he was completely bereft of focus on himself. So now we have a new question. So if he doesn't think about himself at all, why does he talk about the suffering that he experienced? What kind of suffering if 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 there's no self? And even more so. Because his imprisonment and the ensuing torture was a result, a direct result of his holy work in spreading terror and in strengthening the infrastructure of Judaism in, in, in all parts of the former Soviet Union. And this is known, and it's been it's been um, widely uh, promulgated uh, in in the writings about what the Fitzgerald went through. That this was all a result of the work that he was doing. So, the suffering and his experience should have aroused the opposite feeling. He should have been in an in an overture of complete joy. He should have been in a state of joy that he merited through his Aveda to this level of Mesiros Nefesh, not Stam Mesiros Nefesh, but a level of Mesiros Nefesh that included such terrible torture and the fear of death for many days. And the Rebbe says there is a uh, precedent for this. We, we have kind of a model for this. We find regarding Rabbi Akiva, the Gemara teaches, that when the Baal Shem Tov married it, I'm sorry, when, when Rabbi Akiva married it um, to die, Al Kiddush Hashem, at the moment that he gave over his life to Hashem in the midst of excruciating difficulties, he did so with pleasure. Al Shabal Liyade Hadavar Shakol Yamai Hayisi Mitzta'er, that he was able to finally fulfill what he had pined for all the years of his life. See if Dalit, the Yesh Lamer Habir Bazet. And the Rebbe says we might offer the following explanation to answer the question of what the Friedrich Rebbe meant when he said, that it was through the novel teaching of the Baal Shem Tev that he was able to surmount his suffering in prison. Why does he reference that? And why, Bechlal, should he be feeling suffering? Why shouldn't he be feeling joy? Why shouldn't he be feeling pleasure, knowing what he was doing and, and what it resulted from? 
Rabbi says we might say that the following is the explanation. Bimamorov, in one of his Maimorim, in a few of the Maimorim, in the footnote you could see which ones, Mivar Chayk Merichami Admor, as Achiluk Bain Hamasiris Nefesh Rabbi Akiva, the Messiris Nefesh Davram Avinu. The Vedic Rebbe parses the difference between the Messiris Nefesh of Rabbi Akiva and the Messiris Nefesh of Avram Avinu. Rabbi Akiva Amar, Kol Yamai, Hayisi Mitzta Erchule, Masa Yavai Lide, Liyadi, Vakai Menu. Rabbi Akiva said, All of my life, I suffered angst in thinking, when will I finally be able to do this mitzvah of Kiddush Hashem, of dying for Hashem? Hainu. Shechipes v'hishtoikek l'mesiras nefesh mitzad atzma. He looked and he yearned for mesiras nefesh, kwa mesiras nefesh. Mitzad hayoyker ha'atzum shal mesiras nefesh. Because of how dear mesiras nefesh is. Because through Messias Nefesh, a person reaches a higher level of connection and unity with Hashem. And so all of his life, he yearned for this. But in contradistinction, Avram Avinu Avram Avinu was not on the hunt for Messias Nefesh, for Messias Nefesh's sake. In Haya Lefarsim Elokuz Ba'ela. His goal, his mandate was to um, widely spread and um, promote godliness in the world. Like the Torah says, he called there in the name of God. And the Rebbe constantly, constantly repeated, Al Tikra Vayikra, you shouldn't read this. And he called Elavayakri that he made other people call. In other words, he taught Tafeach al Minas Lahatfia. He taught other people, Aleph, so that they could teach Aleph. Kol kulei haya shakua bavidas pirsam elokos. He was in completely and entirely invested in spreading godliness. Vim adavar he took Messias Nefesh, and if it necessitated Messias Nefesh, loimana oisei adavar klal mehem shechabaydasei vuhu masras nafshay, and if. In fulfillment of this mandate, it was necessary for him to engage in Messias Nefesh that never deterred him from his work. But he wasn't Lechatrila looking for Messias Nefesh. He was looking to fulfill the mandate. Ulafichach, Chosh Rabbi Akiva, Oineg, Meinuye HaMessias Nefesh. And that's why once we understand what drove Rabbi Akiva, we understand why he felt pleasure from the suffering that he endured. Because it was in that suffering and it was in what the Romans did to him before his neshama left that his aspiration was finally fulfilled to give up his life for Hashem. Loi came by, but this was not the case by Avram Avinu. Kisha asruhu bebeis hasurim, when Avram Avinu was imprisoned, hitzta'er mikach, he was very upset. Ki b'yaysa sham, loi haya yacha la'asig b'avoydas pirsam el kuzba'ila. Because when he was in prison, he was unable to, to engage in his work of teaching the world monotheism, of teaching the world about Elokos. And the Rebbe uses this to explain what the Fritik Rebbe felt in his miser and his imprisonment. See if he, al derech zehoye gam ezel chok merichami admor bal ha Now in a position to understand 
Well, my father-in-law, our Rebbe, felt, to the extent that we could have insight into this, um, during during his Meiser. Mitzat shleimus v'toivas atzmai, harei hamatzav hanal, shegiyah l'tachlas ha-shleimus b'avaitis b'tziros nefesh ad l'isurei guf kipshutam goyrem l'simcha g'doyla. When you're talking about my father-in-law, the Rebbe says, and his own spiritual agenda and the fulfillment of his spiritual uh, aspirations, yes, then his imprisonment brought him to a crescendo in his avoida, and certainly the avoida of Monsieur Nefesh. It included literal torture of his body. And on that level, yes, that should cause great symptoms. However, but because for the Fritz Rabbi, it wasn't about achieving Messiah's Nefesh. But it was simply about fulfilling his shlichus in this world. That's all that drove him. To spread Tera and mitzvahs and chasidus. Ulakach, Haya Masur Ba Ifen Shashum Davar Loi Haya Yachal Limnoya Ise Mavadasai. So he was so devoted to the extent that nothing could stop him, nothing could deter him. Afilu Kishanidrash Lashem Kach initial Masiras Nefesh, even if it meant that he might die. Every moment and every step that he took in his Aveda, as was witnessed by those who were able to watch him, especially in the former Soviet Union, so when you analyze, when you see what drove the Fitzgerald Rebbe, you understand why he was so troubled, why he did not feel pleasure, why he did not feel joy when he was imprisoned. Because although he was ascending higher and higher spiritually, Kanal, as mentioned above, Garam Hadavar Tsar V'Yisurim, it caused him pain and suffering. Because being in prison prevented him from fulfilling his shlichus. So he wasn't focused on how great was her was his spiritual overture and avoda and what this meant for him. What gave him angst, pain, what was torturous, was that he was unable to fulfill his mandate at this time. Vav. Okay. But the Rebbe is not yet satisfied, and he says we still need further explanation. Gam. And now here, the Rebbe quotes from the words of a letter that wrote, In the great work that I toiled in spreading Torah and strengthening Judaism, Okay, so now the Rebbe is taking us further into the, maybe you could say the inner landscape or the or the mindset. And he's saying, and the great Avayda that Vita Rebbe did, it wasn't only to fulfill his shlichos. It was rather because he wanted to fulfill the kavana el He wanted to, to fulfill the divine intention. 
וכיוון שהמייסר לא היה חס ושלום רק מסש מסוי, אלא אך ורק כתוצאה מהפצץ היעדוס בשלמוס מתוך מסירות נפש בתכלס. הרי מובן בפרשת שככה היה רצון עליין. So, so now this leads us to, to, to having a different kind of question, which was, which is, what was Avita Kappa so upset about? It wasn't his fault. He didn't do anything wrong. He didn't make any misstep. He was doing what the Abishter wanted. He was fulfilling the Abishter's intention, the divine plan. So it was the divine plan. So it was clearly Hashem's plan that he should be imprisoned. It was clearly Hashem's plan that he should undergo the suffering. Vim came, and if so, if the Fe Grebe has only one focus, and that is to fulfill the divine intention, and clearly the divine intention is that he should be in prison and he should undergo the suffering, Hadra Kushya Liduta, we're back to our original question, Ma Mokamyeshli is Bitsarmika. Why is he upset? It, it brings to mind, you know, the famous uh, story, I think, with her mental foot of us. And they asked him, the, uh, his fellow prisoners, uh, why, why is he not upset? Why is he not depressed? He said, the difference between me and you is that each one of you believes you shouldn't be here. You're a doctor, you should be healing. And you're a lawyer, you should be advocating. But I know I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. So what, what am I going to be upset about? So why is the Fetik Rebbe upset? Babir Bazer. So the Rebbe explains. Ba'avaydes ha'neshama l'mala yesh l'chusa shel Kaddish Baruch Hu yesh beiz o'ifanim. When it comes to the avayda of a soul fulfilling God's shlichus mandate, um, marching orders, There are two ways in which this can happen. And to explain this, we're going to illustrate with an example from this earthy world. An example for, that we can all understand. A person can toil at their work. They can be invested in their work in two different ways. There are two modalities. One modality is the modality of an employee. Yes, this employee is dedicated and devoted and he wants to fulfill whatever it is his job is. And let's say you have an employee with a very strong work ethic. And it's not just about the fact that he's getting um, his paycheck. This person is very mission-oriented and they care to do their job correctly. But this notwithstanding, but when push comes to shove, he's an employee. And therefore, and therefore, It doesn't belong to him. The business doesn't belong to him. But now compare and contrast this with when the work is being done by the owner of the business. So his devotion and his punctilious attention to every detail is because it's his business. <laughs> it belongs to him. Now the difference between the owner, and the, the employer and the employee is not that obvious when you observe them during the work day, during the work hours. 
they both are engaged in their in their job and their various uh you know things they have to take care of and maybe even with equal devotion and with equal attention to the job at hand the true difference can be discerned at the end of the workday, during the night between one workday and the other. When the workday is over and you're off the clock, the employee sleeps soundly. He, he sleeps um, b'shalva, peacefully. He did everything. He can. He could sleep soundly because he knows that he did everything he was supposed to do. And if, despite his best efforts, the results are not what one would have hoped for, he knows that he did everything he could. So there's nothing more he can do. There's no further way that he can help. And therefore his conscience does not bother him. He knows he did everything he could do. Masha'en came balabais. In contradistinction, the owner of the business, who in a yacholishem b'matzav kazeh, he cannot sleep when there is a problem in the business. Who in a yacholishem b'menucha kolzman, shahamalacha va'esek enem kidibai. It doesn't matter why it's not going the way it's supposed to be going. But it's not going the way it's supposed to be going. And therefore, he cannot rest. He knows no peace. He is bothered. The Rebbe says, we're going to use this to understand what was going on with the Fidika Rebbe. Al derzeh yesh beis madreyes bin shameis u beis aifanen b'milu kavanes hakadosh baruch hu b'shlichusim ba'al madeim. So just like this is true in the world of business and employment, the same thing is true with Nishamas and their fulfillment of their mandate in this world. One modality is a person who's truly devoted to Hashem's mission, not because he's going to get Gan Eden and not because he's going to get this and not because he's going to get that. He truly wants to fulfill Hashem's intention and he does so inclusive of through Mesir Snefesh. But once he has fulfilled everything that he can, and it still doesn't happen, he's not upset. He knows he did everything he could do. And how much more so? We know, we know that it's halacha, that if there are circumstances beyond your control, Hashem exempts you from from doing whatever mitzvah it is that that you wanted to do, that's a clear halacha. Ubefrat shakol el and especially this person knows that everything happens bashkach el yena. The im came harezed gufa nikba v'nibdad al pi hashkach el yena. So the fact that he could not or she could not fulfill what has to happen, that's all bashkach el yena. So what are they going to be upset about? They know they did everything they could. They know that in halacha there's a paradigm that you can't be held responsible for things that are beyond your your control. And they know that everything happens bashkach el So it must be that the shlichus could not be fulfilled. And not only that, but it can't be fulfilled. Leirak midas midah 
וממילא אין שום טעם וסיבה לצייר. And furthermore, because it's Ashgacha, it's not only that this person, let's say he couldn't fulfill it, because he only has a certain limit to his talent or resources or whatever, but because it was Ashgacha Aliyena, nobody would have been able to fulfill it. So what's there to be upset about? This is simply the way it was supposed to be. But the Rebbe says, but there's another modality. But when a person is so connected and united with Hashem, that Hashem's desire and Hashem's intention becomes His desire and His intention, Azai Avaidosai, but then there's a person who becomes one with the mandate. So much so that it's not a matter of his fulfilling the Abishra's mandate. It's him. It's who he is. There's no daylight. There's no degree of separation. That's his whole existence. That's all there is. And therefore, So even after he has done everything possible, but if what had to happen did not come to fruition, or it did not, was not completely done, so just like the employer, just like the boss, the owner, if it doesn't get done, he has tremendous pain. And I am sure that that many of your minds are in exactly the same place as mine. And thinking about those words that the Rebbe said that were torn out of him with so much pain that he did everything he could and now he's giving it to us. This is an insight into how much pain the Rebbe was in. The fact that he did everything that he could was was no consolation. Ches. The dogma of Davar, and as an example of this kind of devotion, where there's absolutely no difference between the mission and the one who needs to fulfill the mission. It's not like this person is doing it for someone else. It's him. It's his business. <laughs> he owns it. His stocks, his value, his assets are going to go down. He can't sleep. Rebbe says an example of this. The an example of this kind of devotion can be seen from the Rebbe Rashab at a meeting, at one of the many meetings of rabbis in Petterburg. And the Rebbe Rashab was the father of the Balagola. And the meeting took place regarding the fact that the governing body the government wanted that Rabbanim and teachers should include um, uh, secular studies and um, more than secular, uh, heretical uh, st strands when they taught and when they when they gave over, you know, their drushes, etc. Kim Muvan, so as understood, kol gidele Yisrael bismanahu nilchamu b'taykev rab negi gzeruzu. So all of the leaders amongst the Jews 
all rallied and they did war against this terrible Gezeira. Aval sorry hamlucha his hero. Shem loyi vatru lehem, veloyi kablus a gezeira, yasu chas vashalom pro eis bihudin. And the governing bodies warned that if the Jews would not accept this edict and they would not act in comportment with it, they would bring pogroms upon the Jews. So it was a terrible situation because either it'll be terrible spiritually or it's going to be death for many, many Jews. Admar Nishmasa Eden, Diber Ba'isa Asifa Devarim Nimratzin. Rebbe Hashab spoke at that meeting fiery, passionate words. Who besaved Devarav his Aleph. And at the end of his words, he fainted. He fainted. Machmas Kharifus Devarav. Shekalulugam Divre Macho Neged Hasarim Sheimu Bifroz. He tilu all of us, Maasar Besi. Because of the sharpness of his words, that in, that included a censure of uh, those who had threatened the pogroms, they put the the, the Rebbe Shab into house arrest. After he was freed from house arrest, Nichnas. Alav echad, elav echad meharabanim, umatsa yeshev ubaycha. One of the rabbanim came into him, and he sees Rabbi Shab is crying. Amar lo yisarav harebi milabavich madua yifke. Labavich Rabbi, why are you crying? Halayasinu kol mashahaya biadenu lasit. We did everything we could, as if to say, <laughs> it's Abish's fault. Why are you crying? You certainly did everything you could do. We did everything we could do. The, 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 the Rebbe Shabbat answered him, Aval loy nifa. But what had to happen didn't happen. So of what efficacy is it that we did, and what consolation is it that we did everything we we're supposed to do? But we don't have the effect of what we were hoping to accomplish. It didn't happen. Now the Rebbe brings it back to the Fetch Rebbe. And the Bala Geula's Avoida was exactly in this way. The Fetch Rebbe was suffused and, and saturated with the desire of the Abishter with the celestial intention to spread terror mitzvahs and to turn this world in a dear la yisbar. Hare kasher avaydase baze, hufsek al yidei yeshivase b'masar, v'hemshech ha'avayda, amad b'sakana rachman al-aslan. So when he was imprisoned and it caused him to be unable to engage in his work and it endangered the continuation of his work, because he thought he was going to die, it caused him tremendous pain and tremendous suffering. The yeser came, and it was more than that. And the Rebbe says, in order to understand yet a deeper level, I have to preface with the following. Yadua, the Perish HaKasov, it's known, in the explanation of the iconic pasuk, Va'ish Moshe Anav Ma'id Mikol Adam Asher Al Pnei Hadama, that the man Moshe was more humble than any other person that ever lived on the face of the earth. She'ein Hakavana Shemoshe Le'Yadaz Ma'alosav Shebischuson Kibel Torah Misina Egal Es Yisrael Mitzrayim V'Chulei. The pshat of this pasuk is not that Moshe was unaware of his greatness. For which reason he was the one that was able to be Makabal the Torah and give it to the Jews at Sinai, and he was able to redeem the Jews from Mitzrayim, etc., etc. No, that was not the case. He was not oblivious to who he was and what he was. Ella Adraba, on the contrary, 
He knew, he knew what the Abishar had endowed him with. It's precisely because he knew how great he was. His, his humility came from his belief that perhaps if somebody else would have been endowed with the greatness that had been given to him, they would have been able to accomplish more with it. And so the Rebbe says the same thing with my, my Rebbe, my father-in-law. Certainly, he appreciated what Hashem had endowed him with in terms of his ability. This is not the point of the Sikha, but, but this sentence, this sentence alone is worth the price of this class. In order to use out your kaiches properly and completely, you have to be aware of them. So not having a good understanding and appreciation of who you are and what you're capable of is not helpful. Because it thwarts your ability to do what you're supposed to be doing in this world. The chen yada. And Rita Kepa also knew And he also knew that the success of the work of spreading terror and strengthening the infrastructure of Judaism necessitated his involvement. It had to be done by him. And nobody else was able to fulfill the shlichus. And so now it becomes very obvious just how profoundly his imprisonment caused him pain. Like we find with Meshe that after the Ebesha said, you're not going to be able to bring this congregation to the land that I gave to them, meaning to Eretz Yisrael. He was very, very upset. And he davened more. And he beseeched and entreated God again and again and again. He begged that he should be able to bring B'nai Yisrael into Eretz Yisrael. How obstinate Moshe Rabbeinu is. And it's plain and, 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 and obvious that he wasn't doing this for his own self-aggrandizement or some other reason that would benefit him. Elamashen is ave, but rather that he desired and he yearned. But rather his yearning and his beseeching to take B'nai Yisrael into Eretz Yisrael was because he was a faithful servant he wanted to fulfill his shlichus of his master of Akadosh Baruch Hu. He wanted to do what was best for Bnei Yisrael. Meisha Benu Yada Shazesh Shela Achazman Asid Lisrachesh Korban Abayis O Bnei Yisrael Yitzdarchu Lelecha Shuv Legolus Vechule Shayech Lezesh Yeshua Hu She Yikan She Yachnisam LaAretz. Meisha Benu knew that the fact that after some time there would be a Korban Abayis. And B'nai Yisrael would have to go into Golos. That this would all be a result of the fact that Yeshua took them into Eretz Yisrael. Because if he would take them into Eretz Yisrael, none of this would occur. That's why Meshach Abenu 
begged and entreated and beseeched and prayed and cried to be able to bring Bnei Yisrael to Eretz Yisrael. Because if Moshe Rabbeinu would have taken them in, Bnei Yisrael would have lived in Eretz Yisrael eternally. The Beis Hamikdash would never have been destroyed, and there would not have been subsequent um, uh, being enslaved and. Uh, uh, to other to other sovereigns, there would have been um, no further um, subjugations. And the Fitik Rebbe, in like fashion, had tremendous, enormous tsar that he wasn't able to do what he needed to do for Klal Yisrael. Yud, achadayin ain't a move. But the Rebbe says, but there's still more. This is still not understood. If everything is providential and everything can only play out in alignment with the intention of the Creator, and since this is the Kavana Al so for sure the Torah is going to be spread. And Judaism is going to be strengthened, and there's going to be through this further um, gilui, uh, revelation of Elikus in this world. So much so that the whole world becomes an apartment, a dwelling place for Hashem. What was the Vitekab upset about? Irrespective of the fact that we now understand that he lived a life that was one with the mission and that his imprisonment was a speed bump in that mission. But if it's the Kavana el then the imprisonment is also part of the Kavana el So what's he upset about? It can't be that it's in order to weaken his work because that's not in alignment with Abish's intention. On the contrary, Not only was the work not weakened, but as can be seen historically, it was strengthened. After this point. And his work there was so strengthened. It caused. It, it set into motion the possibility for him to leave that country. So. His strengthening of his activities in the former Soviet Union after his imprisonment put into effect that he should be able to leave. In other words, he was recognized, his strength and his stature rose. It, it precipitated the possibility for him to leave. He came to America, and from there, his work was strengthened and spread out so much more greatly and to all corners of the of the earth. And the Rebbe goes back to the Jews' entrance into Israel. Eretz Israel. That although they went in through Yeshua, not through Moshe, and because of that, they were vulnerable to all kinds of suffering. There was possibility for the Chorban Bayez and the Golos, and that's exactly what, what played out. On the other hand, but at the end of the day, it was for their own good. Here's Here's another thing that just if we take only this from the Sikha, Daivi 
that because Moshe Rabbeinu did not come into Eretz Yisrael, it precipitated that all of the ways in which there had to be a gilu elokus, godliness had to be revealed, came through the avoid of the Jews. And this is one of the things that the Rebbe constantly underscores. Koyach atzmai, koyach atzmai, koyach atzmai. The Rebbe could have accomplished everything that he wanted to accomplish by himself. But he wanted to give us a part. Koyach atzmai. And as a result of the fact that it wasn't Moshe Rabbeinu who unilaterally took care of Gilu Elikus, but it was all of B'nai Yisrael for their combined efforts and work that caused and causes that the revelation of godliness of La'asid Lavei will be on a higher level. Then Cain, and if so, Madua Goram Lehadover Litzarvi Yisurim. So again, why is the Tritik Rebbe upset? Why does he have pain? Why is he suffering? We understand it's not about himself. We understand that. And we under and if we can understand that he surely understood. That this is Bahashkacha Alyaina, and this has to happen. And even that through this higher things will happen. So why is he upset? We might say the explanation is as follows. That okay, we now understand that because of the miser, because of the imprisonment, greater things would flow forward later. That this was a mashber, that this was a breaking point from which comes forth the birth of something much greater. In Hebrew, the birthing stool that a woman sits on is called the mashber. Okay. But during the time of his imprisonment, there was a Helen Behester, Lavaida There was an obfuscation on his work of spreading terror. During that time, it wasn't able to proceed even at the pace of before the imprisonment. And this, in and of itself, that during his imprisonment, he wasn't able to lead. And perhaps many of his most devoted Hasidim were busy getting him out of prison so they couldn't do what they would normally be doing that time. This was something that caused him great pain and angst. And look at this. Rabbi says, and it's not just a pain because of how it affects the neshamas of Jews below. But it's pain for what the Abishter is suffering. Because at this time, there wasn't the Gilu Elokus that there could have been. And this is really the same thing, the well-known concept of the symptom of the contraction. As my Rebbe, my father-in-law, the, the Rebbe says, explains in one of his Maimor, Rebbe Yudbeis Tamus. That although the reason why the Abishra engaged in that initial contraction was so that there can be higher levels of revelation that would follow, there would be a world. There couldn't be a world until it's Hitzimarish. There couldn't be people. There couldn't be the Avaidah of Dirla Yisbarach. 
None of this could happen. And we know that the intention is about the revelation. And that's the whole reason for the contraction. At the same time, but simultaneously, as it is it is against the Ratzain Ha'elyeh. Now, this is something we could forbring about for months, years. There's a famous sicha where the Rebbe explains that every time a Jew sins, it can't, even though we have chirachavshis, nothing can happen. Nothing can occur outside of the rubric of the Abishas Kavana. And it is the Abishas Kavana to allow for freedom and latitude in our part, which inevitably allows for sin. So although the sin is not Lafi Haratzim, but it is Lafi Hakavana. So to take a very simple example, every parent wants to raise, hopes to raise healthy children, well-adjusted children. So part of that is giving them the independence to learn the necessary skills to walk through life, whether it's learning how to crawl upstairs or walk across the room, or drive. Inevitably, there's going to be bumps and bruises and scraped knees and pain. And none of that is Lafi Haratzin of the parent. But it is definitely Lafi HaKavana. Because if you hold the child and you don't allow them to walk, to learn how to walk or to learn how to climb upstairs or whatever task or to learn how to ride a bicycle without training wheels or to take the keys to the car. Yes, you're protecting them, but you're stymieing their growth <laughs> and they become unable to do what they're supposed to do in this world. So it's true that the symptom is Lafia Kavana. But it's not lefi haratzi. The guf ve'etzem hatzimtzum hu hefach ratzene elyeh. Because from that symptom, from that helen behester, from that obfuscation, flow all the pain and the travail and the evil that we have to contend with. Ki ratzene elyeh hu shi'a gilu yar. Because the celestial will is that there should be revelation of light, not the darkness. But if there isn't the symptom, if there isn't the darkness, if there isn't the latitude, then 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 we are disabled completely. And so, what's the point of creation? Yiralf. There's so much going on here that it's easy to forget what was our point of departure. The, the Sikha began with the Rebbe questioning why did the Fetik Rebbe say that it was the novel? Shita, the novel uh, opinion of the Baal Shem Tev, that Ashgacha Pratis encompasses all strata of the universe and every detail within every strata and that it was only this that allowed him to tolerate and to live through the suffering of the imprisonment. Abba says to Yeshleimar, we might say, 
Loyal et sema inintash kahapotes bidita tzach. That what the Fetik Rebbe intended with these words is not what the Baal Shem Tov taught about the fact that there's Ashkocha Protis in the inanimate and in the vegetative world and in animal life. The novelty that allowed him to endure the suffering was not the novel idea that Hashkachapratis applies also to the other aspects of creation, but rather in how this Hashgacha on other aspects of creation dovetails with or interfaces with the Hashgacha on every human being. My father-in-law, the Fittig Rebbe, explains in one of his Maimar, Mar Yud Beis Tammuz, that according to the Baal Shem Tev, understanding Hashgachapratis means not only that every detail of every aspect of creation is orchestrated by the creator of the universe. But something much more than this. That every overture of every specific private creation has a relationship, a general relationship to the overarching intention of creation, inclusive of a solitary movement of one blade of grass in that it fulfills the celestial intention for the creation of the universe. And from this we derive a new, a novel understanding in the Hashgacha Pratis that rules basically and um, is the overriding feature of our lives. Even those who taught and believed that Hashgachah was only on humanity, they believed the Hashgachah Elyena on other strata of creation was general rather than specific. For instance, it was hashgacha on every species, but not every animal, not every subsidiary within that species. They believed that the hashgacha, the general hashgacha, let's say on all elephants or all apricots, was a hashgacha that was related to that species, to that kind. But vis-a-vis the way in which the individuals of that larger species interface with a person, they too agreed that there's hashgacha on every detail. Ela shaladatam, but what's the difference? But vis-a-vis their train of thought that for other aspects of creation, if it doesn't impact a person, there's hashgacha klolis rather than hashgacha partis. 
Ela Shalagatam, in their theory, Lo Yigzar Shamiz Barach Al Elu Hadogim Sheyamusu, O Yichyu, Aval Gazar Al Adam Haze, in Yana Yuparna Sasai. They understood that it wasn't that Hashem um, meted out exactly when, for instance, a certain fish was going to die or live. Rather, Hashem said exactly how much parnas a person was going to have. And if this person was a fisher man or fisher woman, then it meant that some of the lives of these fish were going to be truncated. And so when you understand how the hashgacha devolves in the person's livestock, for instance, in Yashmin Shoyer, if his ox will be fattened. Because if he's supposed to have a certain amount of parnasa, then his fat, his ox will be fattened and will be healthy and will fetch a good price at market. In Tishbar Kada, if his pitcher will break, rendering him without the receptacle that he needs to, I don't know, milk his cow and bring that cow, or that, that milk or that cream to market. So according to this opinion, we find, that the specific hashgacha is only on human beings. Because Humanity is, after all, the reason, the goal of creation. And so anything having to do with a person is going to have the advantage of Ashgacha Pratis, even things in the inanimate world, even things in the vegetative world, even in animal life. Now we're in a position to understand the Balshentav Shita with a whole different level of depth. Binyanim Shabahem Nikaris Mailas Adam, Shemach Masa Hutaklis Habriya, Hare Hashgacha Pratis, Hiba Ifen Golo. When it comes to things that are easily recognized as being part and parcel of the advantage of the human being. And the human being is the reason for the entirety of creation. So here, the Hashgach is going to be very revealed. But in unimportant things, in less important things, that don't underscore the greatness of humanity. That kind of peripheral, tangential, ancillary aspect of their life is not going to get hashkocha protest. It's not going to be that obvious. Only the aspects of life that underscore the greatness of humanity. That is according to the other shittas. Ma she'en ken the shittas of Al Shem Toiv she'kol prat bevriya afilo tnuah achas shel desha prati yesh by mitzad atzma yachas klali lechlolus kavanus abriya. But the Bal Shem Tov taught that every single aspect of creation, even one movement of one blade of grass, is related to the overarching intention for the creation of the world, for whom mashlim ha-kavana el-yayna in abriya and fulfilled and brings to fruition the celestial intention in the creation, hari kol shakein v'kal v'chayim shakein hu b'tvarim pratim ha-noigim la-adam. How much more so this is true in the specifics of each person's life, shakol prat uprat, Mitzad atzmai. Notice the words mitzad atzmai are underscored. Every detail in a person's life. Quadita, not in utilitarian fashion, relative to how much they underscore the greatness of the human being. No. The, the detail itself 
brings to fruition the celestial intention in creation of the universe. Maybe this can make us feel better when we obsess over something we lost, like a button or a fork. Or, I don't know if anybody else suffers from this, but I don't know, for some reason, I hate losing things. And as much as I talk to myself and I say, uh, it's not a big deal. It's really not a big deal. Maybe it's because it's so important to the you'd base. And now we're finally positioned to the to the extent that we could understand, to understand through through what the Rebbe is explaining to us, what the Fit Gabba was saying. Sorry that I went on and on because it was the only way to complete the thought. The Chidush in the Baal Shem Tev's teaching vis-a-vis -vis Ashkoch Pratis, revealed and made possible the recognition and the feeling that because the imprisonment and the ensuing torture were Hashgacha Pratos. So in addition to the fact that from the imprisonment will certainly come the- Oh, whole, definitely the denim. That, so, so it became clear and revealed that in addition to the greatness that would follow the imprisonment, that there would be um, greater and stronger Yiddishkeit and 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 promulgation of Teremitzas after the Geula. But what it underscored is that the imprisonment itself and the very painful torture that too completed the 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 the, the intention of the Abishar in creation, which is to reveal godliness in this world. The Yeshleimar, and the Rebbe says, and in case you're grappling with this and you're trying to understand what does this mean, the Rebbe says, we might say, that this actually happened. It actually came to full expression in a way that we can see, that we can quantify. Earlier we said that we might attribute the Fit Rebbe's angst to his worry that his work wasn't going forward at the time that he was imprisoned. But the Rebbe is saying that maybe now we can understand what the Fit Rebbe was saying, that what got him through this was the sheet of the Baal Shem Tov Pratis. And we might say that the very imprisonment caused additional arousal and mysterious nefesh on the part of Jews in general, and specifically the Hasidim and those that were mekushar uh, to the Fetik Rebbe, to strengthen their Avaida in strengthening Yiddishkeit. The Yeser al came. And even more, hadavar nifal gam b'maser gufa, and even in his imprisonment, it led to gilui elikus. Etzem amidosay shall chayk meri chami admar b'toykef atzum baragosay sham. The very way in which my father-in-law Arabe stood in such steadfast fashion while imprisoned. And he did not allow himself to be affected at all by his enemies 
and those that were so obviously fighting Kedusha, the yes are okay. He didn't even reckon with them at all. He did he, he didn't um he didn't give them that uh that importance at all. He, he, he didn't relate to them at all, as if they didn't exist. And he was consistent and constant in this behavior. He didn't flinch. He didn't grovel. He didn't beg. He didn't relate to them at all. He didn't relate this revealed that there's nothing but God. It is very imprisonment. And this caused them to abnegate themselves before the faith of They themselves sent the faith of out. They were forced to do so, as related many times. The Rebbe concludes, What happened then is remembered and is reenacted today. And just like the head moves, so does the rest of the body move in the same direction. So it's understood we follow in the way that the head moves. This is not just history. This is not just inspirational storytelling. This is a for us in our life. First of all, we have to know that nothing, nothing can disrupt Nothing can bother, nothing can stop the fulfillment of the shlichas of the Chaba in spreading Tara and strengthening Yahadus. And especially that it's possible that if we are lackadaisical in our work, if we don't move with the right alacrity, with swiftness, we are holding back, even for a moment, the coming of Mashiach Tzakenu, which means that the Shechina is in Golos. We can't let anything stop us. And on the other hand, we have to know. So at the same time, we have to know that whatever situation that a person finds themselves in, even when, God forbid, they, they don't see a way in which at that present moment they can be spreading Yiddishkeit and Hasidus. Person is forbidden from becoming despondent and depressed. A person has to remember that this too is Ashgachar Pratis, which means, according to this understanding, that this is not... Do you have a restroom in here? I do not. Do not. Okay. This is not um, holding back what has to happen. This is what has to happen. And when you seek, you will find. And in this situation, which seems to be an obstacle, you'll find the way in which godliness can be Revealed, ubigilui mamash, in a very obvious way, and through this, 
Finally, we fact Shagam Avaida Tia Bematsev Dizgalos that the Avaida should be in a revealed way. Shatavi Bizrizus at Bias Mashiach Zakenu, that very quickly our Avaida should bring Mashiach Zakenu, the Nigla Kvaida, Kvaid Hashem, and Hashem's glory will be revealed. The row Chol Basa Yachtov, and all flesh together will see Kipi Hashem. Deeper, that it is the word of Hashem that speaks. What can we say? Except for Amen, but Amen. And again, our learning today is dedicated to Ilo Nishmas, Sima Rivka Bas Nisan Al Halevi, Vakitsu Viraninu Sheikhne Afar. We should be reunited with her, with all of our loved ones, Bevias Mashiach Zakenu. And like she reminded us last week, Mashiach is here. We just have to open our eyes. So we should be able to open our eyes in the right way and see what we have to see immediately. Um, 